Welcome to Stream of Conscience, brought to you by Democracy for America, Fairfield County, where we believe that change is possible and you can make it happen. I'm your host, John Hartwell. Our guest today is Lindsay Farrell, the Executive Director at Connecticut Working Families. Until recently, she was the organization's political and legislative director, where she led the coalition building and direct lobbying efforts to support the passage of Connecticut's first in the nation paid sick days bill. Prior to coming to Connecticut, Lindsay designed and implemented field organizing plans in New York and ran one of the nation's most respected year-round grassroots field organizations. Lindsay, welcome to Stream of Conscience. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So last session, with the governor's help, you got paid sick days through. In, yes, in 2011. In 2011. And now we're in a new session with a new legislative body, people re-elected and some new faces as well. And this year, you're going after an increase in the minimum wage. Talk, talk to me about that. Sure. We're really excited about the campaign. Um, the legislature hasn't voted to increase the minimum wage in five years. So what that means is that every year, we don't increase the minimum wage. We don't index it to the cost of living. Low-wage workers are essentially taking a pay cut as the cost of energy, housing, food, everything goes up. Transportation. Right. I mean, nothing, nothing stays the same. And, right. and prices were very different five years ago when we last voted on this. And so what's the minimum wage now? In Connecticut, it's 8.25 uh, an hour, which is actually higher than the, the federal minimum of 7.25 an hour. We're not the highest state, but we, we are the state with the highest cost of living. So we definitely need to make sure that we have a minimum wage that matches that. And what is, it, what is being required or requested? The proposal that is uh, coming out of the Labor Committee right now is an increase of 75 cents this July, 75 cents next July, and then indexing to the cost of living after that, so that we don't have to keep having this legislative fight over and over again, talking about you know what the working poor in this in this economy in Connecticut um, deserve, and as the cost of living goes up, those expenses such as housing and transportation and, and energy uh, goes up automatically. The the wage keeps pace with that, so that our low wage workers aren't constantly having to catch up. So this is a working families party issue. Mm -hmm. Um, and you are a, a, an organized political party in the state. You run candidates in some in some places on the working families line alone, and in some places you uh, you cross endorse. Mm -hmm. I think that's been your primary uh, mode of success. So, in in all of the political work that you've been doing, who's now coming out to help you uh, get this paid sick days through? I'm not paid sick days. I'm sorry. <laughs> Increase in the minimum, minimum wage. wage. We, well, we, we put together a coalition of organizations that deal with low-wage workers and low-income populations, as well as labor organizations, you know, a lot of labor organizations. Mm -hmm. um, their membership does much better than the minimum wage because they get to collectively bargain and they get a decent wage, but uh, they care about the economy that we live in and they care about the, the state of the working person in, in Connecticut, so they're also invested in that fight. And then also legislators who understand that uh, you know, the minimum wage is just too low in Connecticut. You can't support a family. It's detrimental to the whole economy because low-wage workers can't afford to uh, spend at local restaurants or at local shops because they don't have the disposable income. So it's a, essentially a coalition between, you know, labor organizations, folks who represent low-income families, and, and legislators. So when we say minimum wage workers um, in Connecticut, mm -hmm. we're talking about people who work in fast food restaurants, um, talking about Walmart, is that do they pay well, minimum wage? Walmart or? pays minimum wage. Um, th there are a lot of businesses that actually have done really, really well since the recession started to turn around that are still paying minimum wage. Walmart pays minimum wage. The, the CEO of Walmart makes in one year what every single employee, a thousand employees in Connecticut, make in one year based, based on the wage discrepancy there. Um, Yum Brands, which is Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, a lot of those you know big chain restaurants, Burger King, you know those places all tend to pay minimum wage. Um, small businesses tend to pay a little bit better to start with uh, because they know their employees. There's a relationship there. People, you know, want to invest in their employees, and they understand that we all do better with with a rising tide. And you said that a lot of union people already are doing better than minimum wage because they can collectively bargain. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's the collective bargaining 
uh, landscape in these companies that we've just been talking about? Um, it's non-existent. You know, there is no Walmart union. There is no McDonald's union. They fight very, very hard to prevent those things from happening. There, you know, there are uh, organizations that that have been working to organize. Uh, Walmart employees or employees at, at these big box stores, but um, the climate is not favorable to that right now. So we need to make sure that we can give those workers a decent wage with legislation. And what's your strategy for the legislation? How do you hope to move it through the, the state legislature? It has to go through several committees, I'm sure, uh, and then make its way both to the House and Senate floor before it would end up on Malloy's desk. So what, how does that happen? Well, we, we have to make the case. That's our job as advocates. You know, uh, we start with telling the stories of low-wage workers. You know, one of the myths that's out there is that everybody's a teenager who's on minimum wage. They have no real responsibilities. Actually, four out of five minimum wage workers are 20 or older. The majority of them are over 30, actually. Really? Um, so these are people with real responsibilities, with children to feed, and, and we have to show that, uh, that that's the case and illustrate that story. The other thing is let's have a real conversation about the impact on business that policies like raising the minimum wage actually have. Um, you know, I had mentioned that the, the big box stores that tend to pay low wages have done well, even though we've been in a, a struggling economy for several years. Mm -hmm. Of the 50 largest low wage employers in, in the United States, 35 of them are not only doing as well as they were doing in 2007, but doing better. They're more profitable now than they were then. And you have studies to back that up. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there, it, the economy that we're living in is not one where everybody's struggling. The, the large employers, the, the large corporations, their CEOs, their executives, they're doing fine and it hasn't come down to the rest of us yet. And so what that means is that low-wage workers can't afford to pay their rent. They can't afford to eat at the local diner. And when you put money into the pockets of the people who uh, make a very small amount of money, they spend it all locally. Right. It stimulates the local economy. So we'd rather send our money um, into the local economy and local businesses as opposed to sending it to stockholders and, and CEOs of these companies out of state. When we think about Connecticut, most people think of it as being a rich state with uh, very high incomes, um, you know, lots of investment going on, uh, but I think you're dealing with a different population here that also exists in Connecticut. Well, Connecticut is actually a lot like Guatemala in that our rich are very rich and our poor are very poor. Um, that's another study that came out recently. The economic disparity in Connecticut is the worst in the nation. Um, we're always ranking in the top three where our wealthy are very wealthy. But, um, you know, trickle-down economics doesn't work and unless you put in solid policies to make sure that, that, uh, that wealth is accessible to low-income people, the, you know, those communities don't have access to it. So, you know, there's actually been a lot of attention to this in the media lately where Connecticut's inequality is so bad and our poverty has actually risen 45% in the last couple decades. Um, so we are a rich state, we're also a very poor state, and, and raising the, the base wage in the state is one way that we can fix that. And what about the impact uh, on lots of the small businesses, the dry cleaners or, or the, the diner that's not part of a nationwide chain that, that you know, benefits right. from you know, mass advertising and, and, and bulk purchasing? Right. Uh, what would raising the minimum wage do to these people? Well, we, we had a couple business owners actually testify at the public hearing for the bill last, last week. Um, one of them is uh, Doug Wade, um, who submitted testimony. He owns a dairy with 47 employees in Bridgeport. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he doesn't start at minimum wage. I mean, he starts at, at a decent wage, you know, well above 11 or $14 an hour just as the basic wage. Really? Um, part of it is because he knows his employees. He knows that if an employee can't afford to make ends meet, they're going to be a lesser effective employee because they have to piece together several jobs, they're tired, they're hungry, they just can't be as effective at work. Um, and he cares about them as people because he, he actually has a relationship with them. But he also understands that you know he sells a product and a product um, requires demand if he's going to be successful. And so he wants to, to see our economy stimulated. He wants to make sure that people can buy you know the, the ice cream and all of the wonderful things that he makes at his business. And you were talking about, about the ages of people who are, are um, 
on minimum wage. What about the sort of family relationships? Do you have any idea how many of them are single parents, for example? That actually, I, that's not data that I have. Um, I mean, hopefully not too many because, uh, you know, the minimum wage in the state is about $17,000 a year. For a family of four, you need to be well above $20,000 a year to be out of the poverty level. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, two parents working <laughs> full-time minimum wage jobs would be able to support a very small family. But um, that's just not always the reality in today's day and age with our families. And so how are you going to make the case? Are you going to bring people to Hartford uh, to demonstrate or to testify? Are you going to have events in towns where they are to, to influence legislators where they live. What's the, sure. what's the strategy? We're going to do as much as we can. You know, we've been, uh, since the beginning of the year, out on doors talking to people about the minimum wage. It's incredibly... Um, out on doors, out meaning on, you're going right. canvassing now. Yes. This is not the not, election not season. Not during the week, not during the week okay. when it was like 11 degrees every day. <laughs> right. Then we were on the phones, actually. Really? But, um, you know, knocking on doors and calling people and saying, you know, there's a campaign, there's a piece of legislation, there's actually something that you can do about this issue and and most people on this issue are incredibly receptive people people whether they work for a middle class job or a low income job and a lot of people who work for for a very lucrative job understand that this is good for the economy so and, and where where families. are you going door to door and who do you go to door with and who are your your ground troops in this our ground troops are just organizers who care about the issues you know people who uh, who care about making the world um, you know, a fairer economy for families in Connecticut. And we go to we go to doors in places where the legislators haven't made up their mind yet. You know, it's like a, like an election. You know, you, you have the people who are definitely with you, the people who are definitely against you, and the ones that you have to make your case to and persuade. So we talk to the voters in the districts where legislators haven't made up their mind yet so that they can send in phone calls and letters and emails to say, you know, I really want to see the minimum wage increase. That's important to me. Right. Um, you know, it's just democracy 101. So it's it's back to grassroots campaigning in not in an election time, but mm -hmm. rather to influence how a legislator sees the people in their district and, and what they're for. Right. Um, and I think people find that uh, occasionally refreshing. You know, they're used to having their door knocked or their phone call during election time. Uh, with people asking for votes, but to actually have that follow-up to actually be doing something about the issue is, you know, it's a, an essential part of the process. The other things that we, we do is, you know, we do lobbying at the Capitol. Um, I always encourage people to come up to the Capitol up to Hartford. We're a small state, so, it, you know, it's an accessible thing to do for, right. for a lot of people. There are lobbyists there every day. They get paid six figures to, to be in our legislators' ears saying, you know, the minimum wage is the end of time. <laughs> it's a terrible idea. Right. Um, and, you know, it's harder for, for our, real people to take time out of their, their schedules and their lives to, to go actually be heard by the legislators, but it's essential. But it is, as you say, it's, it's accessible. Mm -hmm. you, anyone can walk into the Capitol building. Anyone can stand uh, outside the the hall where the legislature is meeting on the second floor of the House or the third floor where the Senate is. And you can buttonhole your your, your representative or your senator. Or you, you can talk to these people. You don't have to, I mean, there are lots of lobbyists there, but that's because <laughs> there's lots of opportunity. Uh, it, it, there are a lot of lobbies there. We actually have a, a high per capita amount of lobbying going on in the state of Connecticut, really? but it's also a very accessible democracy, like you were saying. Right. You can come to Hartford. Anybody's allowed in. Uh, all you have to do is find a security guard. They'll tell you where your legislator from the town that you come from, where their office is, um, and you just have to look for them. And you know they, they wander the halls same as us, and they're very accessible if you want to go talk to them. You know, I actually had a people don't realize that this stuff actually works. We we had a person call last week. They We had called them because we wanted them to call their senator and say, I'm supporting the minimum wage increase. I hope you'll do the same thing. And the next day, their senator called them back to say, actually, I am supporting it. Um, and it was this, the same proposal that we're talking about with the uh, 75 cents and 75 cents and in indexing. And they were so shocked so that this they was had the to senator, call us. this was a senator that you had targeted that you didn't know where they stood. Right. Then you reached out to one of their constituents, mm -hmm. and the constituent reaches back out to the right. senator, and now you know that the senator's on your side. Yes, but it was it was wonderful because it was actually like so inspiring to the the voter who we had talked sure. to. You know, it's 
sometimes when people get used to sending in emails and stuff to Congress and they don't hear anything back, they get frustrated, they don't think well, the they system get a works. Letter. It totally works. They got yeah. a personal phone call back from their state senator yeah. saying, you know what, I hear you guys. I've been getting calls like this from my voters. I'm voting yes. Cool. Yeah. Let's talk about a, a slightly different situation. Okay. Um, moving away from Hartford <laughs> and, and back to the grassroots um, in Bridgeport, mm -hmm. um, there was an election this past fall uh, for Board of Ed. Mm -hmm. And the story behind that is, is a little convoluted. Um, they threw out the old Board of Ed. They were installing somebody from Hartford through the, through the uh, educational mm -hmm. apparatus up here. Um, that got turned down in the courts and they had to go back and have a real election. Yeah. And you guys were in the middle of it. Let's, let's talk about that. Yeah, well not only did they actually have to have a real election, but they tried to change the rules once again. Mm. They put a uh, question on the ballot that did... These are Republicans, right? They're doing no, this? No, no, these are no? Democrats. Oh, these, these are, are Democrats. Democrats. Trying to change the rules. <laughs> this is in Bridgeport. Okay. So. Um, the, once they lost the Supreme Court ruling that the Board of Education was going That's to be... That's the state Supreme Court. Yes, the state Supreme yes. Court ruling that the, the Board of Education would, would in fact be elected. They've tried to put a ballot question um, to change the charter of the city hmm. so that it would be appointed by the mayor and ah. it would just hand over con control of the schools to the mayor the way that Bloomberg has, has achieved in New York City. Right. And, uh, you know, this is part of a larger fight about education reform in, in America right now. Um, the corporate interests are gunning for our schools, and they're doing it because they want to dismantle the unions and go after the unions and, and uh, the take teachers them down. unions. The teachers' unions. Yeah. Also, you know, custodial unions, paraprofessionals, school nurses, all of those guys. Um, but they also want access to a very, very large pot of money. Um, mm. You know, our schools are never adequately funded in places like Bridgeport, but it's still hundreds of millions of dollars that is going into public programs and, and that, uh, you know, private interests have an interest at. at having access to. Sure. So, you know, that's much easier to do when the school board is not accountable to voters. It's just appointed by the mayor and he can replace anybody who isn't doing what he wants and, and they never have to actually feel that accountability to the people in the community. So we, we fought that very strongly. We partnered with some really great organizations, Connecticut Citizen Action Group, um, AFT, American Federation of Teachers here in, in Connecticut. Uh, CEA Connecticut Education Association and a lot of local organizations to take that on. We were very, very uh, badly outspent. There was about $180,000 that came in from Michelle Rees group. Um, you said Bloomberg was involved? Yeah, Bloomberg put in $20,000 of his own money. Um, mm. Which you know, which is weird because this is, these are Democrats who are pushing this and being funded very, very heavily by Republicans. But um, we, we got the community really just excited about this at the grassroots level. We had a lot of very great local leaders. Some of them are our own board members, such as Sada Baraka, Maria Pereira, John Bagley, um, a lot of clergy members. But you know, people don't believe that their schools are going to be better when we hand them over to hedge fund managers from Greenwich as opposed to electing them from the community. You know, the, the first thing that needs to happen for a school to survive and to thrive is that there needs to be a strong relationship between the parents and the families and the community with the school. And eliminating those elections just makes that farther away. So in the election itself, who was running uh, and how did it come out? Well, there was a special election before there was the, the charter revision. So um, we, we ran two candidates in the special election for Board of Education. It's a staggered term, which means we elect half of it in alternating years. Um, one of them won, so now we have a, a delegation of four out of the nine seats on the Board of Education. So four of the nine seats on the Board of Education in mm -hmm. Bridgeport belong to the Working Families Party? Uh, Three of them belong to the Working Families Party, and there's a Democrat who is defected in essentially and caucuses, caucuses with Caucuses yeah. with you guys. And mm -hmm. the other five are from machine, the... Yeah, they're machine, the Machine Democrats. Machine Democrats. Um, and the Republicans are nowhere in sight. <laughs> uh, they, you, they aren't. I mean, the You are the minority party in Bridgeport. Essentially. Good. Um, okay. Essentially. And then, so you elected the people to the Board of Ed, mm -hmm. um, and then there was also this the charter revision. Mm -hmm. And how did that come out? Uh, we won. We won that, even though we were so badly outspent. Um, 
Uh, and it, you know, it was it was a big win. Like I said, you know, twenty thousand dollars from Bloomberg and all this extra money coming from outside of town. Um, you know, we didn't have a lot to to throw into it. We just had a really really strong message. We did you know what we do best. We talked to people at the doors on the phones to make sure they understood the issue, and uh, and and we prevailed. Fifty three percent of the vote against the the charter revision. Fifty three forty seven. Mm -hmm. So it's a done deal now. That's all. It's finished. It'll never come back again. <laughs> Probably not. I mean, we we've, we've learned over and over again um, with education reform issues in Bridgeport, when, when the powers that be that want to take over the school system don't get what they want, they go back and try to figure it out again. You know, initially they, they orchestrated this uh, behind the scenes takeover from the state of the elected Board of Education. Mm -hmm. They lost that in the Supreme Court here in the state. Um, then they tried to push it through in an in a emergency certificate, certified piece of legislation at the legislature. That failed when people understood what it was about up at the legislature. Then they tried to, to feed us in the elections and make sure that we didn't elect a stronger uh, caucus on, on the board. We still elected people. Um, and then they tried to just change the city charter to make the rules what they wanted, and, and they lost that too. So I'm, I'm betting they're going to try again. <laughs> if at first you don't succeed, or right. if at second you don't succeed, <laughs> just keep trying. There's yeah. plenty of money there. Right. So what else are you going to be working on? Um, you know, you've got uh, the paid sick days is done. Mm -hmm. uh, minimum wage, uh, you've, I think you're not confident, but you're optimistic that that's going to be increased. You won a big victory in Bridgeport, um, holding the line on the schools mm -hmm. and, and making sure that people have a chance to vote. Um, up here in Hartford, um, you've been able to elect a, a registrar of voters, uh, and you've got some people on the city council. Is that mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Where does the where does your organization go from here? Uh, there are a couple other issues that we're we're working on. Obviously, we're very concerned at the congressional level what's going to happen with the the earned benefit programs such as Medicare, Medicaid, um, Social Security. Mm -hmm. You know, any deal that's going to continue to talk about austerity and balancing budgets and doing things like that on the backs of, of working in low-income people is something we'll, we'll always oppose. Um, here in Hartford, we're, we're in the process of uh, pushing for a vote to uh, eliminate Bank of America as the, um, the like official bank of the city of Hartford where, you know, all the tax dollars go and they manage all the finances for the city. You know, the Bank of America um, has foreclosed hundreds of homes in the city and they're going to do hundreds more sure. and they don't deserve our money. Right. Um, so must, those are must be a local yeah. bank that we could deal with. There must be a local bank that we could Somewhere. deal with or at least a, a, you know, a bank that just is, is, does better by the people of the city of Hartford. The, the taxes, their tax dollars are just not meant to be spent that way. Um, and then at the legislative level, another bill that we're pushing for would create more accountability and transparency around um, the economic development dollars that get spent. You know, when we do a project like First Five or the DCD hands out a grant or a subsidy or a tax break, you know, we'd like to make sure that... Of which the there are $5 billion <laughs> right. of tax breaks yeah. written into the, these, uh, these tax codes that we have um, here. Yeah, I mean, it's the, we're seeing more and more uh, money spent in, in that way, right. but there isn't really a lot of accountability. We barely keep track of how many jobs are being created locally. We don't keep track at all of what the quality of the job is. So, you know, if we're going to spend $40 million, for example, to make ESPN build a facility here, those construction jobs should be middle class jobs. Those sure. those service jobs, you know, the cafeteria workers, the janitorial staff, the, the security guards, they shouldn't be minimum wage jobs that, that you know, can't support a family. They they should be uh, decent enough wage jobs that that people can take care of themselves. So, if tax breaks are coming from the government for economic development, mm -hmm. uh, at least a healthy portion of that money should flow directly to the people who are going to be working in the facilities. Right. I mean, we we shouldn't pay twice. Basically, right. you know, we shouldn't pay to have them stay here in Connecticut or to come into Connecticut and then have to pay food stamps, Husky, you know, all of these things that, that become required when we're, we're keeping people in poverty. Right. Very quickly, um, any municipalities that you're going to target in the upcoming year? I think we'll keep an interest in Bridgeport, obviously. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, that's, there's a lot of important, uh, a lot of issues going on there. Right. Um, and the, the rest we'll have to see. Okay. Well, Lindsay, you guys are doing a lot. 
and it's really well needed and I appreciate all the time that you're putting into this. It's, uh, it's really good to hear about it. Right. Well, thanks for having me on the show. I'm always happy to be here. Okay. Right. Mark Twain said it best, there are lies, damned lies, and statistics. On the right, you hear a familiar refrain. When Social Security was created, the average life expectancy was about 60 years. Now, they say, people live much longer, into their late 70s. So, we have to change the system. Both of these facts about life expectancy are true. But the former is irrelevant, and the latter is not as big a change as it seems. And so the implications for social policy are not as simple as critics on the right make out. Why is average life expectancy irrelevant? Doesn't it make sense that people live longer now than they did in the 1930s? Yes, of course. But you have to look at the right number. The average life expectancy number that conservatives quote is calculated from birth. So, it includes child mortality as well as death from industrial and farm work. These were much higher then, bringing the average for the whole population down significantly. Social Security was designed to take care of people after they stopped working. So it needed to take into account how much longer people would expect to live from that point. And in fact, a 60-year-old white male in 1930 had a life expectancy of another 15 years, and a 70-year-old had another nine to go. In other words, if you had survived childhood diseases, if you had survived working in a factory or on a farm, if you hadn't been killed in a war, and you had actually reached retirement age, you were likely to keep on living for years to come. This, by the way, was nothing new. In 1850, the life expectancy of a 60-year-old white male was even longer, about 15 and a half years. In 1900, it had fallen a bit to under 14 and a half. In 1920, it had bounced back to just over 15. So Congress, when it created Social Security, certainly knew that the system needed to be properly funded so retirees could collect benefits. The average life expectancy argument is simply a red herring. When you hear Mitch McConnell or Paul Ryan or Marco Rubio quote this number, it's like watching a talented musician as he misdirects your gaze so he can fix the deck. It's an irrelevant number and it should be retired and put back on the shelf. It is true, however, that people are living longer but it's only about an extra five years after retirement, not 15 or 20 as implied by the original argument. Five years of benefits is not trivial. It comes with a cost that must be financed. This is the debate we should have because it requires either raising revenue or cutting benefits. There is no free lunch. Mark Twain's notion that you should never trust anyone with facts and figures or that you can use statistics to prove any point that you want to make haunts every policy discussion. It should not deter us, however, from looking carefully at the facts and using them to frame a debate. The current fight over Social Security is a case in point. Looking at the right data, we should understand that this is a manageable problem, not a looming catastrophe. The system needs a tweak, not reconstructive surgery. This has been a Stream of Conscience Commentary. I'm John Hartwell. Thanks for watching. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. You can catch all our shows on YouTube by going to youtube.com slash user slash DFATVnet. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. And you can send comments or suggestions for a show to info at dfa-tv.net. If you'd like to learn more about progressive political action, we meet on the first Wednesday of the month at 7 p.m. at the Silver Star Diner in Norwalk. We'd love to have you join us. Remember... Change is possible, and you can make it happen. This has been Stream of Conscience. I'm your host, John Hartwell. Thanks for watching.